So we're going to return to a book that we've gone over in uh, old videos. Wanted to go ahead and uh, come back to it and read full chapters. A lot of good information, especially for the new people. Information we've gone over before, but only briefly. Uh, this book is called Anacalypsis, an attempt to draw aside the veil of the Saitic Isis, or an inquiry into the origin of languages, nations, and religions by the late Godfrey Higgins. This is volume two from 1836. And I go to chapter four of this book, and it says here, I must now draw my reader's attention to perhaps the most curious of all the subjects hitherto discussed, and that is the history of Mexico and Peru. It might be supposed that these, of all nations, were the least likely to afford any useful information respecting the system or mythos which I have been unveiling. But they are, in fact, rich in interesting circumstances that have hitherto been totally inexplicable all right he's finding a lot of things similar to the old world basically what he's going to uh, show you guys so he's like and it's unexplained inexplicable but which are easily explained on the hypothesis that there was in very early times an universal empire governed by a learned priest would mean america was part of the old world many months after the anacalypsis had been in the press lord kingsborough's Magnificent work on Mexico made its appearance. This will account for the manner in which I have spoken of Mexican hieroglyphics in the first volume. My reader will readily believe me when I say it was with great pleasure. I discovered in every part of that work circumstances which can only be accounted for on the theory laid down by me and which therefore confirm it in a very remarkable manner. His Lordship's difficulties are very striking. The language of the Jews their mythos, laws, customs are everywhere apparent. They're talking about in ancient Mexico. What? The mythos, the laws and customs of the Hebrews, the Jews, Israelites. All over, apparently, all over. This his lordship accounts for by supposing that in ancient times, colonies of Jews went to America from Alexandria. But this by no means accounts for the difficulty because the Trinity, the crucifixion, and other doctrines of Christianity are intermixed with every part of the Jewish rites, which must be accounted for. Therefore, to remove this new difficulty, he is obliged to suppose that Christian missionaries in the early times of the gospel found their way to America. All right, so they can't explain why there's all these stories like Christianity in the Old Testament. Now, I want to, before we continue, in case you guys don't know, never heard of Lord Kingsborough. So, real quick, we're going to talk about Lord Kingsborough, who he's quoting. Basically, as it says here, Edward King, best known as Lord Kingsborough, was an Irish collector influenced by the spirit of European 16th and 17th centuries antiquarians. Accumulation and possession of manuscripts and documents from other lands and cultures was one of the many proofs of colonial domination. Knowing about the other or knowing the other was very much a symbolic extension of the imperial power over the colonies. So over to the right here, we have uh, a copy of uh, one of his volumes. He has uh, nine volumes of this, what we call Antiquities of Mexico, all right, facsimiles of ancient Mexican paintings and hieroglyphics. We're talking about exact copies. 
in the Royal Libraries of Paris, Berlin, Dresden, in the Imperial Library of Vienna, in the Vatican Library, in the Borgia Museum at Rome, in the Library Institute at Bologna, and in the Bolivian Library at Oxford, together with the Monuments of New Spain by Mr. Dupont. All right, so all that is in uh, Antiquities of Mexico in the nine volumes. So again, Antiquities of Mexico, nine volumes are an underestimated contribution to Mesoamerican studies to accomplish his ambition. Kingsborough asked the Italian painter Agostino Anglio Cremona, already known in England because of his work with architects and in church decoration to reproduce the Mesoamerican codex directly from the originals, which were located in libraries and private collections at different European cities. All right. So, yeah, so Lord Kingsborough's uh, one of his books is just literally codices, filled with codices. And then on other volumes, he's explaining the codices, breaking down the story. And eventually he finds a lot of stories, just like the stories of the Old Testament. We've actually read a lot of that in my old Hebrew videos. We're going to read this chapter today and I get some more information. Now, Wikipedia says Edward King Viscount Kingsborough. Right, was an Irish antiquarian who sought to prove that the indigenous peoples of the Americas were a lost tribe of Israel. The indigenous people of the Americas, right? That's kind of like a generalization, but in general, yeah, this is the promised land, so there was lost tribes of Israel here. His principal contribution was in making available facsimiles of ancient documents and some of the earliest explorers' reports on pre-Columbian ruins and Maya civilization, okay? And that's what's in these books. And that is who Godfrey, this author of Anacalypsis, is quoting. I just want you guys to know who he was talking about so we can continue again. So he's calling him his lordships, all right? Now, admitting this to have taken place, he's talking about Hebrews over here, right, in America. It's insufficiency to account for the various incomprehensible circumstances, if not already, will very shortly be clearly proved. The South Americans had not the knowledge of letters when the Spaniards arrived among them, nor did they know the use of iron. All right, so dash the hijack here a little bit. These facts are of themselves almost enough to prove, and really do prove, when combined with other circumstances, that the Jewish customs and doctrines could not have been carried to them from Alexandria, as above suggested, or by modern Christians, who would have instantly set them to dig in their mountains. But on the contrary, these facts prove that the colonization must have taken place previously to the discovery of iron by the natives of the old world long before Alexandria was built. All right. So they're like trying to see when did they come? But he doesn't understand or overstand that this is the true old world. They've been here. And this agrees very well. The two facts exhibit the mythos and existence at a period extremely remote indeed. For the identity of rights such as circumcision found in India, Syria, Egypt, and South America puts the great antiquity and identity of, of the mythoses out of all doubt. David Malcolm, in his book called Antiquities of Britain, which is so ingeniously contrived that it cannot be referred to by chapter, number, page, or in any other way, gives the following passage as an extract from Solomon's modern history. St. Austin, Speaking of the notion some entertain of another continent, he says, it is not agreeable to reason or good sense to affirm that men may pass over so great an ocean as the Atlantic from this continent to the new found world, or that there are inhabitants there, all men being descended from the first man, Adam. All right? They're from Adam. It's not impossible that they crossed the Atlantic. We know that they did, right? Now, this shows that from the time of Christ to the fourth century, when this African bishop lived, but then resided at Rome, there had been no colonization. It was impossible to have taken place without his knowledge. And this absolutely proves the truth of the existence of the Christian mythos before the time of Christ. The jealousy of the Pope and the court of Spain in keeping all strangers away from South America, even to the extreme length for many years of excluding their own bishops, listen, and circular clergy, and permitting no priests but Dominicans and Franciscans to go theater. So they were like kind of censoring and controlling who goes to America because they were finding all these things over here and they didn't want people that weren't with them, you know, to go spill the beans over there. So they were sending only, as they were saying, Dominicans and Franciscans. The clear and unquestionable doctrines of Judaism and Christianity, which must have existed before the time of Christ, evidently overthrew all their vulgar esoteric doctrines, whatever they might do with the esoteric or those in the conclave. All right. So he's talking like whatever they do, you know, when they pick their popes over there 
esoteric stuff. Lord Kingsborough says, but one solution offers itself from all the difficulties and mysteries which seem to be inseparable from the study of the ancient monuments, paintings, and mythology of the Mexicans, and that is the presence of the Jews in the New World. Had his lordship said the Judaic mythos, he would have been right, for nothing can be more clear than that it is all substantially there, and most intimately mixed, actually amalgamated, he might have added with the Christians. Hellenized, huh? The similarity between the Jews, Christians, and South Americans is sufficiently striking, but there is yet something to me still more so, which is that several of the doctrines which I have advocated in this work, unknown to the vulgar Jews and Christians of this day, are to be found in Mexico. Their triune God, their creator, is called by the names Jao and Hom. Lord Kingsborough says, Hom Eyoka, which signifies the place in which exists the creator of the universe or the first cause to whom they gave the name of Hom Eteuli, which means the god of threefold dignity or three gods, the same as Om Onris, and by another name, Hom Eikan, that is to say, the place of the Holy Trinity, who according to the opinion of many of their old men, begot by their word, Sipatenal, and a woman called Sheumio. In the Hom Eyoka, When joined with the other circumstances, I cannot but recognize the Om and Ai, Om Mia, place of Om, and again in Om Ikan, the Aum Yao Anya, the place or country of self-existence. Om is called the Trinity. And what are we to make of the home, the father of the word by the Logos? The father of the American Trinity is called Om Equeturiki. All right, and then it starts talking French here. Here on the Om of North India, the Urus or beef and the Piru, that is the Ru, are very distinct. These have evidently not come from modern Christianity, but from the ancient system in the most ancient of times. Tiutle is repeatedly said to mean OS or God. Sahagun says the Mexicans had a God, the same as Bacchus called Ometeuchtli. Here is clearly Bacchus by his name of, who has called the which was the name of Jesus Christ called the desire of all nations, the Om Nu'al of Isaiah. Here in the Teut, we have not only the Eos of the Greeks, but we have the Teutatis of the British Druids and the Doth of Egypt and the Buddha of India under his name Tat. But it is expressly said in several other places that God was called Zhao. How can anyone doubt that here are the remains of an ancient system? How can anyone believe that the Jews would carry all these recondite matters to Mexico, even if they did go at any time, and that they would amalgamate them all together as we have them here? The Mexican history gives a long account of their arrival in Mexico, from a distant country far to the west. The stations where the colony rested from time to time during this long migration, which took many years, are particularly described and it is said that the ruins of the towns which they occupied are to be seen in several places along the coast. I think it is evident that this migration from the west is merely a mythos. The circumstances are such as to render it totally incredible. In principle, it is the same as that of the Jews, but accommodated to the circumstances of the New World. It really seems impossible to read Lord Kingsborough's notes on page 241 and not to see that the mythos of a chosen people and a God conducting them after long migrations to a promised land attributed by the Spanish monks to the contrivance of the devil was common to Jews, Christians, and Mexicans. We're talking about the ancient Mexicans. I think it seems clear from page 186 that Mexico or Mexico, listen to this, was the Hebrew Mexi, then it would be the country of the Messiah or might equally be the country of the leader whom we call Moses. Mexico, the country of Mexi. Mexico of the people whom we have found in Western Syria and South India and Kashmir. His lordship shows that the word Mesitli or Mexico is precisely the same as the Hebrew word Mishi or Mise or anointed. And that one of these gods shall sit on the right hand of the other. Page 82. In the next page, he says the full 
accomplishment of the prophecy of his Savior in the person of Quetzalcoatl. Quetzalcoatl, who's Quetzalcoatl? We're talking about Jehoshua, Meshi, has been acknowledged by the Jews in America. He says, page 100, the temptation of Quetzalcoatl, the fast of 40 days ordained by the Mexican ritual, the cup with which he was presented to drink, the reed, which was his sign, the morning star, which he is designated, the tepal or stone which was laid on his altar, is that the stone of destiny and called Teotepal or divine stone, which was likewise an object of adoration. All these circumstances connected with many others relating to Quetzalcoatl, which are here omitted, are very curious and mysterious. But why are they omitted by his lordship? The pious monks accounted for all these things by the agency of the devil and burned all the hieroglyphic books containing them whenever it was in their power. So what he's referring to is that the, when the Spanish were here, you know, colonizing, and they noticed a lot of these uh, Hebrew, Semitic traditions, Old World Babylonian, Chaldean traditions, they attribute that to the devil uh, teaching them that, and they just burned everything. That's what they would say. This migration of the Mexicans from the West is evidently exactly similar to the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. Again, you hear what they're saying here, right? The migration stories of the Mexica, the original Toltec people, Mexica, they were leaving this place. They were following their leader, Mexi, Mexi, going to their promised land. And that's what he's saying is exactly similar to the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. The going out with great noise and clamor is a part of the mythos. Nimrod has shown that it is to be found among the Greeks in their Bacchic festivals and also among the Romans. See his second volume, article Populi Fugia. The meaning of the mythos I cannot even suspect, and the nonsense of Nimrod about Babel and the horrors of Gina Kokrasi give no assistance. But the fact of the similarity of the histories proves that it really is a part of the mythos. That is, that a Regi Fugia and Populi Fugia is a part of the mythos. On the religion of the Hindus, the Cambridge Key says, the pristine religion of the Hindus was, I think, that of the most pure and ancient Catholic faith. And the religion of the enlightened few still continues such. They have worshipped a savior as the redeemer of the world for more than 4,800 years. The religion of their forefathers they brought with them from the old world and established in the new. All right, that's the hijack. This is the old world. They believe implicitly in a redeemer whom they consider as the spirit that moved on the waters of the creation, the God that existed before all worlds. We shall find this, the Mexican faith. All right, so again, we're reading this person's view on everything. It's uh, an interesting breakdown he has with certain things, all right? So, you know, we dodged the hijack, we pulled the babies out, but it is a very interesting reading. Continuing, he says, The God who led the Mexicans in their migration was called Jao Teotle, God of Armies. Jao being said to mean army of, or victory. The very meaning given to it by the Jews and Sankris scholars tell me, also by the Indians. Teo is said to be oil or deo, the tle, mere termination, but as I have stated in volume 1, page 221, that TTL is T300, T300, L50, and TT is in fact the Tat or Buddha of India, okay? Buddha of India. Peotle is the same as Pelot and means 650, which as an emblem of the Trinitarian God came to mean three. I believe also that this has a connection in some way with the TLD, probably originally Tilt or Tulad, the male organ of generation. I believe that from this comes our word Lad. Teolt is the supreme and invisible being. The Tat is the name of the Tartars, or as often called Tatars. And I am persuaded that the famous Titans were probably Tatans. Many reasons for these matters will be added hereafter. General Valency says the earliest Irish history begins with Cartuelta, which is the same as the Indo Scythian Sir Tiwutli, that is, Caesar or Caesar, grandson of Noah, on the banks of the Caspian, 300 years after the flood. Here I suspect that we have the Caesar of Indo-Scythia, or of the Caspian, joined to the Mexican 
Teotli or Teotli. Yeah, so real quick, going right back to the previous page where I mentioned Cartuelta. That's so interesting to me now after uh, doing that video with the Carians and the Car, Carib, Ara, people. They're saying their leader, this magician, combination of three letters, K A R, and it was Car. Whenever you see Car, that was them. So it's interesting that in the Irish history, the earliest history is supposedly starts with Cartuelta, Car, who happens to be Caesar or Caesar, grandson of Noah. I'm going to go ahead and dig on that, try to find who that person is in history. But very interesting when I saw the car, possibly connected to my last video. In page 216, Mr. Humboldt, threats of a nation called Choshimilex. This must be Yaka Melek, or I should rather say, considering all the other circumstances which we have seen relating to the Raja Hutans and royal shepherds. The royal Saxons, for I much suspect they were all the same people, all right? The royal Saxons. And again, you already know, Saxons, the sons of Isaac. Check out my Israel and the Nations of Europe series that I recently did. There's three parts of that. Who are the Saxons? This book's letting you know all the correlations this author has been doing in his research. This is from 1836, remember? He's saying the Raja Putans and royal shepherds are the royal saxons same people and he's saying these are the chochimilex or the shaka melek saka sak melek king royal saxons that's deep right there all right let's continue the marquis spinero in his lectures has quoted a person called carly as having deeply studied the origin of nations and languages, and who he says has asserted that the Egyptians peopled America. All right, so that's the hijack again. The Egyptians, um, Egypt was in America. Tamari is here, so he's partially right. He particularly notices a word as being held sacred among the Egyptians and in the Pacific Ocean. It is taboo. But this is nothing but buta, read anagrammically, or in fact, in the old Hebrew fashion. The high priest of North American Indians was called Sakim. Listen to this. I think we have here both the Saga and the Agni, and also the Skiakam, which we have before noticed in Tibet. The dignity of sacrificer was supreme and hereditary, like a feudal title. His title was Papa, his dress garlic, with fringes as a border. This exactly answers to the Sagard and Rex sacrificulus of the ancients the fringes of the mexicans were fixed to the four quarters of their garments as a sacred ordinance precisely like those of the jews and it is only fair to suppose as they were similar in one respect they should be so in another and have been descriptive of the number 600 all right so, so i just want to point out that he actually points out a lot of sources as he's talking so for example, he continues saying, Botorini says, so Botorini is one of those persons who was like one of those conquistadors or explorers at the time of conquest. He says, no pagan nation refers primitive events to fixed states like the Indians, meaning the Americans. They recount to us the history of the creation of the world, of the deluge, of the confusion of tongues, all right? All these Bible stories, the Indians had all this at the time of the Tower of Babel of other epochs and ages of the world, of their ancestors' long travels in Asia, with the years precisely distinguished by their corresponding characters. They record in the year of seven rabbits, the great eclipse which happened at the crucifixion of Christ our Lord, and the first Indians who were converted to Christianity, who at that time were perfectly well acquainted with their own chronology, and applied themselves with the utmost diligence to ours, have transmitted to us the information that from the creation of the world to the happy nativity of Christ, 5,199 years had elapsed, which is the opinion or computation of the LXX. One of their period is 4,008 years BC, another 4,801. Their fourth age, the editor says, according to the Mexican symbols, lasted 5,206 years, all right, so different ages. And the early Christians converts made it out 5,100 and 
99 years. This was evidently the computation of 5,200 years of Eusebius. The period of 4,801 is the sum of the eight ages of the correct Neros, eight times 600. The Mexicans are said to be great astronomers. The Mexicans believed that the millennium would commence at the end of some cycle of 52 years, four times 13 equals 52. And they concluded each of these periods with deep lamentations and terrors and hailed with corresponding joy the moment when the new cycle had commenced, which showed that they had a new 52 year lease. This was exactly the case with the lamentations for the death of Osiris, Adonis, and his resurrection from the tomb. The new cycle having commenced, the danger had passed. At first, I doubt not, this was only every 600 years. Afterwards, with the increase in uncertainty of the ends of those periods, and also with the increase of superstition, the festivals of Osiris came for the sake of security to be celebrated every year. Lord Kingsborough says, Christians might have feared the return of every period of 52 years as being nearly the anniversary of the age which Christ had attained when he was crucified, and of the great eclipse which sacred history records, and which, since profane history is silent respecting it, it is very remarkable how the Mexicans should have become acquainted with. The first pair were called Hue Hue. It's a quote disappeared at the end of 52 years at the great festival in Cholula. Here is the Afanasia. Mr. Humboldt, oh, again, he's quoting Alexander Humboldt from the 1700s, gives nearly the same account. He says, at the end of the 52 year, they had a grand festival. When all lights were extinguished and after crucifying a man, they kindled a fire by the friction of the wood of the ivy on his breast, from which they were all relighted. It was their belief that the world would be destroyed at the end of one of these cycles. And as soon as this fire was kindled and the critical moment passed, which assured them that a new cycle was to run, they indulged in the greatest joy. He shows that they knew cleaned and furnished all their houses and temples, precisely as was done by the ancient Egyptians. And he might have added, as is also done by the Romish church at every jubilee. He shows that the Mexicans had convents of monks, precisely like the Tibetans in the Romish church. After this, humble states that M. Laplace, from a careful examination, had come to the conclusion that the Mexicans knew the length of the tropical year more correctly than Hipparchus, and almost as correctly as al Mamo. And he shows from various astronomical circumstances that they must have had a close connection with Eastern Asia and its cycles. All right. So remember, we got videos already about the Maya and, and people from America who are the Nagas, you know, going all around the world. Where is Atlantis? Who are the ancient navigators? Who's the so-called Phoenicians? Remember all that and apply all that knowledge for what we're reading right now so you can understand and dodge the hijacks and pull out the babies. Humble says this predilection for periodical series and the existence of a cycle of 60 years appears to reveal the Tartarian origin of the nations of the new continent. Tartarian origin. He then states that the cycle of 60 years was divided into four parts. These small cycles represent the four seasons of the great year. Each of them contained 185 moons, which corresponded with 15 Chinese Tibetan years and consequently with the real indictions observed in the time of Constantine. Here we see the identity accounted for of the chronological period stated above by Lord Kingsborough with those of the old world, as corrected by the two Caesars with the assistance of the Chaldeans of the East, the Chaldeans, Chaldeans, Caledonians, Chaldeans, Chaldeans, Ireland. On this, I shall have something very curious in a future book. Mr. Neilber says, what we call Roman numerals are Etruscan and frequently seen on their monuments. But these signs are of the hieroglyphic kind and belong to an earlier mode of symbolical writing and used before the introduction of alphabetical characters. They resemble the Aztecan in this. Listen to this. All right. Just like we broke down the other day, where we get phonetics from, from these hieroglyphics, these pictographs, the old, old Paleo Paleo Hebrew right that looks like hieroglyphics now he's saying roman numerals is really etruscans but the etruscans got it from something much older a hieroglyphic kind that resembles what 
the Aztecan in this, all right, that they represent objects individually. They were of native origin at the time when the West, with all its primitive peculiarities, was utterly unknown to the East, all right? They were of native origin at the same period when the Tour de Tani framed their written characters in literature. Here also a phenomenon presents itself, which fills us moderns with astonishment, an exceedingly accurate measurement of time, and even in the cyclical year, quite, quite in the spirit in which the early Mexican legislators conducted the chronology, portions of time measured off from periods of very long duration, determined with astronomical precision, and without regard to the lunar changes. Besides these, the Etruscans had a civil lunar year, which the cyclical only served to correct. But there was something remarkable, and not to be lightly disregarded, in the affinity between the wisdom of the ancient West and the science at one time perhaps more widely diffused over that hemisphere, and of which the Mexicans still preserved the hereditary. All right? It was still preserved by the Mexicans. He's saying, you know, this ancient wisdom, the Mexicans were still practicing it when they got there. So who do you think is the original people? Though probably useless possession at the time when their country was destroyed. This deserves more attentive consideration since the discovery of an analogy between the Basque and American languages. Listen to this future video. The Basque, who are the Basque? I've been saying it a lot, guys. What is the analogies between the Basque and the American languages by a celebrated scholar, Professor Vader? And these observations, we surely have a very extraordinary confirmation of my theory. If the Romans calculated by a period of saculum of 120 years, they would come to the same conclusions as if they took the 60 or 600. And in this, we see why the Mexican and Roman periods agreed in the time of Constantine and Eusebius, they would not have agreed before the time when the solstice was corrected by Sosigenes and the Chaldean. They would have buried more than 500 years. This we shall refer to in a future book when it will be understood and something exceedingly striking will be unfolded. Humble says, the Mexicans hold that before the flood, which took place 4,800 years after the creation of the world, the earth was inhabited by giants. One of them, after the flood, called Shelhua, or the architect, built an immense pyramidal tower, which was to reach to heaven. But the gods offended, destroyed it with lightning. Here is a complete jumble of the ancient mythology. The 4800 are the eight cycles before Christ. The architect is the Megalister, or the name of God made into the giant, and is Shalhua. The self-existent X, the tower, is the exact model of the Tower of Babel, as given in our old histories. They're talking about the Pyramid of Shalula, guys. So we've gone over this. The legend around it is that Shalhua, this giant, built it, and he built it. It was a replica of the Tower of Babel, so he wouldn't have to go through a flood again, just in case. After its destruction, it was dedicated to Quetzalcoatl, the god of the air. This is Saka, or Indra. Listen to this, Saka. That is the Sakae that goes back to the Saxons, who are the Saxons, sons of Isaac, who's Isaac, Saka, or Indra, whom we found crucified in Nepal. See volume one, page 230. The Mexicans chanted the word Ulula is, which belongs to no Mexican dialect, to the honor of their gods. This is evidently the Alleluia of the Greeks and Hebrews and the Ulalu of the Irish. It is said that after the deluge sacrificing commenced, the person who answers to Noah entered the, an ark with six others, and that soon after the deluge, his descendants built the tower of Tulan, Cholula. Partly to see what was going on in heaven, and partly for fear of another deluge, but it was destroyed by a thunder and lightning. The story of sending birds out of the ark, the confusion and dispersion of tribes, is the same in general character with that of the Bible. All right, they're talking about this. This was in Mexico. His lordship says, in attempting to explain how the Indians could have become acquainted with events of such remote antiquity, coval with the foundation of the earliest monarchies, it would be absurd to suppose that their annals and native traditions extended backwards to a period unknown to Egyptians, Persians, 
Greeks or Sanctus history, all right? They're like, it, it, it would be crazy to think that. But this is what we've been telling you, right? He just said it. It, it almost seems that it goes way before all these other nations here. Who founded all these nations? Who civilized who? America's the true old world. Absorbed as it may be to suppose this, their hieroglyphic annals evidently do does extend backwards. He said, even though it sounds crazy to think that, their codices, their history, their hieroglyphics, it goes way back. They have all these stories of origin. His lordship says the difficulty of comprehending the plan of the Tower of Belus given by Herodotus vanishes on inspecting the plans of the Mexican temples. The Tourettes and the Great Temple described in page 380 were 360 in number. Up to the Temple Cholula were 120 gradas. The brick base of the Tower of Cholulan, which remains and was built in order to escape another flood, If it should come, it's 1,800 feet in circumference. It is said to have been destroyed by a stone from heaven. It is pyramidal. Humble says it is hollow. I have little doubt that the word Cho has been XL 650 monogram, which it may be remembered is found in the oldest catacombs at Rome. Teokali is the name of the temple of Cholula. This is said to be the house of Teokali. This is evidently Teo or God Kali. House of God is precisely the Hebrew style. The word Cholula is thought by Lord Kingsborough to be a corruption of the word Jerusalem. He thinks the same of a place called Churula, but I suspect that they were identical. At Cholula is the very large temple with the very celebrated pyramid, which is said to be a very close imitation of the Temple of Belus or Tower of Babel. A room in one of the pyramids of Cholula had its ceiling formed like the temple at Komil Mart of overhanging stones. In volume 21 of the classical journal will be found some interesting remarks of Mr. Faber's own on the close similarity between the pyramid on the mountain Cholula of the Mexicans and the Tower of Belus. That one is a copy of the other or that they are both taken from some common mythos cannot possibly be doubted. This being premised, I would ask my reader whether he can doubt a moment that the well-known deity, Omorca, of the Chaldeans, listen to this, is the home Eyeka of the Mexicans. Okay? Who's the Chaldeans? Who's the Maya? Who is the Chaldeans? Who is Keset? Who is Arfisha's descendants? We're just talking about Chaldeans. Thus, we have not only the mythos of the Greeks and Bacchus, of Christianity, of Judaism, of Tartary, and of North and South India and Mexico, but we have the very oldest mythos of Babylon. So he's finding all this here in America, all these mythos, what he's calling it. I think, my reader, how came this mythos of Babylon in Mexico? Did it go by China? I think my reader, when he considers all these circumstances, must see that my theory of one universal empire and mythos will explain all the difficulties and that it alone can explain them. Mr. Humboldt, after showing that the Tower of Cholula was in every respect a close imitation of that described by Theodorus and Herodotus at Babylon, okay, a close imitation. This is Alexander Humboldt, 1700s, he went... He saw the pyramid. He did all his measurements. We read it before. And he concluded this. This is the exact copy of the Tower of Belus that Diodorus and Herodotus described. They haven't found the one that these people described. So this has to be the original one. Both in its form and in astronomical uses to which it was applied states as if it was not doubted by a settled fact that it was built after the time of Muhammad. At this time, the Tower of Belus had for many centuries been in ruins, and its country a perfect desert. This at once shows that no dependence can be placed in Mr. Humble's speculation on this subject. All right, so just because they still view in it, you know, the old world on that side, they're like, no, but it was already, you know, in ruins. Oh, gosh, the hijack on the chronologies and all that. Okay, we're going to do future videos. It's going to be a great series. Shout out to 432 The Drop Radio who brought this out years back. 
we got phantoms and duplicates in our chronology. You'll see what I mean. Study the works of Anatoly Fomenko. For surely no one will credit the recent date of this work, supposing even that it were built by emigrants from Egypt or from Chinese Tartary. In that age, after the time of Muhammad, what should induce either Jews or Christians to expand an immense sum in money or labor to build a tower of Babel in Mexico or anywhere else? After the description of the Mexican pyramidal towers, Mr. Humboldt goes on to state that there are similar pyramidal towers in Virginia and Canada. All right, just like this one. Got the exact same ones in Virginia and Canada. All right, where are they? Are they still hidden? Containing galleries lined with stone. He states the temple of Choshikalco accurately to face the four cardinal points to be built of stone beautifully wrought but without cement, each tone in form of a parallelo piped. The Mexican's large temple, placed on conical hill called Chochicalco, meant, as they say, house of flowers. This is Shaka. This almost sounds like Sak, right? Saka. Isaac. Saxon. Saka. And Calx or Kalit. Calix, which means rose. The hill was excavated into large caves. Wonderful to behold when it is considered, as it is there observed, that the Mexicans had no iron. An observation is made by M. Dupox that the Mexicans are now quite ignorant of the meaning of their proper names. In page 71, it appears that the temple at Mexico is, in substance and fact, called the Temple of Sinate. C being pronounced like a S, so Sinate and thus making the temple of Sin, or Sion, oh, which will be explained in the book on letters. Lord Kingsborough calls it Sinai, or Sina. All right, the original Sina, or China. That's the original name of China, Sina. All right, you guys paying attention? I feel little doubt that one of the first names of God in the first written language, for reasons which I shall give when I explain the origin of letters, in all nations, languages, and times, would be the divus, or he does the hijack. With his variety of forms, the next perhaps would be descriptive of 360. This might be described in various ways as TLI, T300, L50, 110, equals 360. The meaning of these three numbers would be the glorious orb we daily behold, the sun and God. For reasons which I shall assign, I suppose D was the first and the prevailing name of God during many generations. All right, so this is again his, and he keeps saying believe, right? This is his opinions. Afterwards, when astronomy so much improved that the knowledge of the Neros of 650 was acquired, the name TTL 650 was adopted as his name, and we have it in Mexico, where figures were known, but not syllabic letters. In the name of the deity Teotle, the periods show how far at the time in which they branched off from Asia. China Superior, India Superior, North America was connected to Asia. The knowledge of the system had extended the period from the creation to Christ of 5,200 years, embraces the eight ages of their cycle, their TTL, Teotle, 650 times 8, 5,200, corresponding with the period of Eusebius. In India, the name 360 fell into disuse and was lost and was probably su superseded by the words Titlu. 666, hmm, TTL, 650, plus IU, or IU, equals 16, equals 666, at last, by the number now used, TT, 600. I know not how I could have invented anything more in accordance with my theory than that this Mexican god should have this peculiar appropriate name. Had I set my wits to work for the purpose of invention, Tiolt signifies in the Mexican language both the sun and an age, and the image of the sun surrounded with rays and the symbol of the latter. Mr. Fred Schlegel has observed that the word ATL or ALT or ATEL is found in the languages of the east of Europe, that it means water, okay, water, ATL, water, and that its symbol has found its way into the Greek alphabet in the letter MEM, all right, got that MEM, Got that water, that mem. Shout out to Joseph.
in the undulating shape by which water is meant, all right, the symbol, that it is also in the Phoenician and most Western nations. It is in the Estoteland of Greenland, which is, I suspect, the Anya Estotel. And I also suspect that it is the symbol of the center letter and of water because it is the symbol of fluid of any kind. I think this leads to the meaning of our word land, la anya di, the holy country, the holy country. It's like Isil means refuge. Almost all persons who have written respecting the Mexicans have observed the similarity of their language to that of the Hebrews. Okay, this and many other strange things the monks admit most unwillingly and attribute to the devil. All right, they want to blame. Oh, how did they learn Hebrew? It must have been the devil that taught them. Why would the devil teach them Hebrew? Like, that doesn't make any sense, but this is what they were trying to write and, and reason in their heads. They couldn't uh, understand how the Me Mexicans or the people of the Americas knew all these old world mythos or stories and actually spoke the old world languages. La Casa said that the language of Saint Domingo was corrupt Hebrew. All right, it's Hispaniola. The Caribbees have the word Neketali, meaning dead. In Hebrew, Kital, Kilali is dead. In Hebrew, Hil, Kaniche, a cane, sugar. In Hebrew, Kene, Eneka, a collar. In Hebrew, Onk. La Casas wrote on account of the Mexicans, in which we are told. He states his belief that they are descended from the Jews, all right? So again, this is not me. This is a lot of information that we've actually gone over in my Hebrew up original series from way back. We've got a lot of these references, as you guys can see. Hope you guys understand. This is the true old world. We had many of the old world nations here. Yeah, all these old world languages and what they're calling so-called Jews, such the hijack. We already did a video breaking down what that word is. That's a made-up word. But we know what they mean, right? This account, by his desire, was never published. But why should he object to its being known that the Mexicans descended from the Jews? The reason is very evident. It was because he saw it was ridiculous, and he did not believe it himself. This book is in the Academy of History at Madrid. It was examined a few years ago by the government, but it was not thought proper to publish it. Or I see a book that they haven't published that De La Casas wrote identifying in them as you know hebrew speaking people people of the bible lord kingsborough gives the following passage las casas persuasion that the indians were descended from the jews is elsewhere mentioned but as the words locella tua manifestum the facet were discovered with some other reasons tending towards the same conclusion by torquemada and some private papers containing the will of las casas at the same time, that great weight must be attached to so solemnly recorded an opinion. It cannot be said that that learned prelate was guilty of any indiscretion in promulgating it. But the contrary is proved by the proviso which he made respecting the publication of his history. That is, should not be printed till 50 years after his death, and then only if it appeared good to be superior of his order and for the benefit of religion but that in the intermediate time no layman or young ecclesiastic was to be permitted to read it. The work has never been published, and Don Martin Fernandez de Navarrete says that when it was referred some years ago to the Academy of History at Madrid to take their decision respecting its publication, they did not think it convenient. You see, they didn't want to publish that account of De Las Casas. I now learn that permission has been given to Lord Kingsborough to copy it. The secret in practice is found to answer no longer. The old proverb applies. I shall be surprised if anything important be found in it, as much as I should have been to have heard that the French found many diamonds at Loreto when they got there, or secret learning in the Vatican Library when they got to Rome. David Malcolm in his essay on Antiquities of Britain says, Take it in the sense of Whitfleet, thus PM 12, which in substance amounts to this. And when the Spaniards were in the Magna Insula Indice Haiti, when the bell rang for evening prayers, the Spaniards, according to custom, bowed their knees and signed themselves with the cross. The Indians did imitate them with great reverence, falling down on their knees and joining their hands together, rather as I think for imitation than for any other reason. 
though there are several who think that the Indians had the cross and veneration long before the arrival of Columbus, all right? So they weren't worshiping the cross like, you know, Christians were. The symbol of the cross was around since ancient times, especially here in the Americas. We got a video on that. You know, you just got to research it. You'll see that it was all over here. We saw many symbols of the cross actually the other day at the museums I went to, right? I showed you guys and a lot of these uh, potteries and vases and stuff. They had the cross all over. Gomorrah, book three, chapter 32 tells of St. Andrew's cross, which is the same with that of Burgundy, was in very great veneration among the Kumans and that they fortified themselves with the cross against the incursions of evil spirits and were and used to put them upon newborn infants, which thing very justly deserves admiration. So they're talking about an indigenous tribe was doing that. That's what Gomara wrote. Continuing says, neither can it be conceived how such a right should prevail among savages unless they have learned this adoration of the cross from mariners or strangers who being carried thither by the violence of tempest have died or been buried there which without all doubt would have also happened to that Andalusian pilot who died in the house of Columbus, unless he had been very skillful in sea affairs, and so had observed his course when he was hurried away with the force of the storms. It is very credible that many of those who are generally reckoned to have been foundered at sea did really meet with accidents of this kind, but the accusamilens says bring another reason of a door in the cross, and which seems nearer truth to wit, that they had received by tradition from their forefathers that a formerly a man more glorious than the sun had passed through these countries and suffered on the cross. All right, so you got to touch the hijack because the author is very like, Christian. So they try to add their you know Christian views onto everything. But the cross existed in Americas before Christianity. Here we have the mythos clear enough in Hispaniola. The Reverend Dr. Hyde, speaking of the priests of Peru, takes occasion to say, all right, and then it's Latin here. No wonder the University of Oxford refused to print any more of his manuscripts. He was speaking of a virgin of Peru who was pregnant by the sun. The Reverend Doctors of Oxford did write not to publish his works while he lived and to destroy his manuscripts when he died. He ought to have been burned himself. Omnique Regione, indeed. Acosta says that the Americans adored the sea under the name Mamacocha. I believe this was the marine Venus Mama. Cochap is the same thing. The Mexicans baptized their children, and the water which they used they called the water of regeneration. The Mexican king danced before the god and was consecrated and anointed by the high priest with holy unction. On one day of the year, all the fires were put out and lightened again from one sacred fire in the temple. The practice of the Druids, Lord Kingsborough, shows that the Messiah of the Jews is foretold to have an ugly or marred countenance and that the Mexican Quetzalcoatl is said to have had the same. At the end of October, they had a festival exactly answering to all saints and all souls. They call it the Festival of advocates because each human being had an advocate to plead for him thus we have this festival throughout modern europe in tibet and an ancient festival of the druids all right it's the same thing they were practicing here in americas okay so the druids of Saman in ireland and in mexico doing the same thing there is the story of the rebellious angels and the war in heaven this is not from our Pentateuch. The Peruvians had a festival called the Festival of Capacreme in the first month of their year called Raime. Acosta supposes this was contrived by the devil in imitation of the Passover. All right, here we go, blaming the devil because they found all these old world stories over here. So the devil came and told us all this stuff, right? <laughs> That's the hijack. It may be observed that all the acts of worship are directed avowedly to the sun. The Mexicans sacrificed human victims, which Lord Kingsborough has shown was practiced by the Jews who were, according to his lordship's account, horrible cannibals. Georges shows that the god Shaka was constantly called Shio. This was 
Shiuth Tekutle, or God of Fire, or God of Years, or the Everlasting One of the Mexicans. Volney says the Teleotians are a Tartar nation. Tartar. Buddha was Hermes, and Hermes was Mercury, and Mercury was the god of merchants, and Buddha was Shaka, and Saka, and the Mexican god of merchants was Yaka Tekutli. Is this Taf Teotli? Or Hermes, Mercury, Buddha? Hmm. In the history of the Aztecs of Mexico, we find much respect in one Cocox, saved on a raft in a great flood. I remember Cocox is Noah, the same person. We got a specific video on that, all the uh, flood stories here in uh, ancient America. Now, when I consider that the Mexicans are so closely connected with North India, all right, North India, and that their accounts are all preserved by mixture of hieroglyphics and unwritten tradition, I cannot help suspecting that this Cocox ought to be Sasaks or Sasaks. Nagualism is a doctrine known in America. What is Nagualism? In reference to the Nagas, softened or corrupted, and the Hag of England, where the serpent is called Culebra. This is Colubra, and the followers of it are called Chivim. These are the Evites or Hivites or Ophites. Eve is Hivya or Hiwa. The Mexicans had a 40 days fast in memory of one of their sacred persons who was tempted 40 days on a mountain. He drinks through a reed. He is called the morning star, etc., etc. This must be the same person noticed before, to have had a reed for an emblem. As Lord Kingsborough says, these are the things which are very curious and mysterious. The inhabitants of Florida chant the word Hosanna in their religious service, and their priests were named Juanas. Stina is the ancient name of China. Right, what I was saying earlier, I suspect Sina and Sian or Siam are the same word. The god of Haiti was called Yohanna. The C is evidently instead of the Asperati in Johanna. One of the temples has the name of Sina Teokali. That is, I suppose, Temple of Kali, the god of Sina or Siam. Lord Kingsborough says the Mexicans honor the cross. They knew them, the Chiribians, or Chiribi Chenses, which name differs from that of Chibirias, the mother of Bacab, honor the cross. The Incas had a cross of very fine marble, or beautiful jasper, highly polished of one piece three-fourths of an L in length and three fingers in width and thickness. It was kept in a sacred chamber, of a palace and held in great veneration. All right, so I've read this in the uh, actual Spanish account, and I can't find the uh, Spanish account that I had read this in, but I know what they're talking about. This so-called uh, cross, it wasn't, you know, a Christian cross. It was something they had, and it was like made out of a, a crystal, very special crystal. And then the Spaniards, as it says here, enriched this cross with gold and jewels and placed it in the Cathedral of Cusco. So, right, so they grabbed that cross and turned it into their symbol in the cathedral. People don't know. They think the Europeans brought it. They think it's a sign to do with Christianity. And it was actually something the Incas had in their palace. Mexican temples are in the form of a cross and face the four cardinal points. It's a cult. It's represented in the painters of the Codex Borgianus, nailed to the cross. All right. Yeah, gets a cold nailed to the cross, okay? Sometimes even the two thieves are there crucified with him. We got a whole video on gets a cold. Make sure you check that one out if you haven't. In volume two, plate 75, the God is crucified in the heavens in a circle of 19 figures. The number of the metonic cycle. A serpent is depriving him of the organs of generation. In the Codex Borgianus, the Mexican god is represented crucified and nailed to the cross and in another place hanging to it with a cross in his hands. And in one instance where the figure is not merely outlined, the cross is red, the clothes are colored, and the face and hands quite black. All right. Again, 
and the face and hands quite black, dark skin, swarthy. We're talking about kids are cold, not Jesus. Kids are cold being so-called crucified, hanged, or whatever, that symbology. Where do they get this story from? Who's kids are cold, really? And again, they're letting us know what his appearance is like. His face and hands quite black. If this was the Christianity of the German Nestorius, how came he to teach that the crucified Savior was black? <laughs> well, that's a major drop right there. How did they know he was black, though? So what this author is saying is one thing to draw the Savior being crucified here in the Americas. The other thing is to know that he was dark-skinned, a so-called black man. Do you hear that major drop? Body back for the illusion. Ha <laughs> drop nation. The name of the God who was crucified was Kitsakult. I suspect this was Saka or Shaka or Kaka, the courtly or God. Remember, Saka is the Saka, eh? is the son of Isaac. The mother of Kitsakult is called Soshi Ketsal. May this be mother of Shaka? Sochi or Suchi Kekal is both male and female. On page 71 and 73 of the Codis, Borgianos, the burial, descent into hell, and the resurrection are represented. In one of the plates, the God is crucified on a mountain. I suspect that this is Prometheus. The Immaculate Conception is described. This is also described in Torquemada's Indian Monarchy. The Mexican word Dios meant God, and he was called ineffable. The Immaculate Conception is described in the Codus Vaticanus. The Virgin Chimalman, also called Toshiketzal or Suchiquetzal, was the mother of Quetzalcoatl. Toshiketzal means the lifting up of roses. All right, so remember, in the myths of Quetzalcoatl, in these codices, his mom was a virgin, just like you know, the Christianity story. Eve is called Inestli, and it is said she sinned by plucking roses. But in another place, these roses are called Fruta del Arbor. The Mexicans call the father Izona, the son Bacab, and the Holy Ghost Egva. This, they say, they received from their ancestors. The Lakmi of India is called Tri. These are the same as the Mexican Centeot. Example, San Teot. And Centeot is Khan or Kunteot, the Kunti, the name of the female generative principle in India. The Mexican Eve is called Sushi Kekal. A messenger from heaven announced to her that she should bear a son who would bruise the serpent's head. He presents her with a rose. This was the commencement of an age, which was called the age of roses. In India, this is called the age of the lotus, the water rose. Upon this, it may be observed that if this had been a papist forgery, the woman and not the seed of the woman would have bruised the head. It may also be observed that if this had come from the western part of the old world since the time of Constantine, it would certainly have had the woman and not the seed of the woman. He's making a point there. It's not exactly the same. It's actually talking about the, her son. A man would do it in the American version. But you see where they copied <laughs> the uh, story from. All this history of monkish writer is perfectly certain in the invention of the devil. Torquemada's Indian history was mutilated at Madrid before it was published. Suki Kekal is called the Queen of Heaven. So you see they made her into the Queen of Heaven in ancient Babylon. She conceived a son without connection with man, who is the god of air. This is the Immaculate Conception and the god Indra, whom we found crucified and raised from the dead in Nepal. The Mohammedans have a tradition that Christ was conceived by the smelling of a rose. The temples of Quetzalcoatl were round. He was the inventor of temples in this form. In the 36th chapter of Marco Paulo, an account is given of the sacrifice in the province of Tanguth a little north of Nepal, of a ram of a year old, which is said to be offered as a ransom for the child. The same is practiced among the Chinese. Torquemada says two things are very remarkable. The first is that the parents of the children should have sold them. 
and given them voluntarily for sacrifice. The second, that the sale itself should have taken place on the second day of this month, February, at the very time that we, who are Christians, celebrate the festival of the presentation of the Virgin without spot in the Temple of Jerusalem, holding in her arms her most blessed child, the Son of God, whose life was sold for the sin of the first woman who existed in the world, carrying him to the present and making an offering of him, manifesting as it were to the God, the sacrifice which was afterwards to be accomplished on the tree of the cross. All right, so that's the hijack there with Torquemada's beliefs. All right, so that's an old account, right? Torquemada's uh, from colonial times. Mr. Humboldt has written much respect in the Americans. It is remarkable circumstance that it should never have occurred to him that the ignorance in the South Americans of the use of letters and iron were decisive circumstantial proofs of their very great antiquity and their very early separation from the stock of the old world. But this great antiquity he considers proved from a variety of other circumstances, he says, it cannot be doubted that the greater part of the nations of America belong to a race of men who isolated ever since the infancy of the world from the rest of mankind, exhibit in the nature and diversity of language, in their features and the confirmation of their skull, incontestable proofs of an early and complete separation. Except in the article language, he is quite right. Malcolm shows that Tauta in the American language means father, Tata. So in Costa Rica, in our slang, or the way we say dad or, or pops or, or dad, you know, father, we say tata. And I started looking that up. It's actually very widespread all around the world. But that was an indigenous word here. It's not Spanish. It's part of our Costa Rican slang. Malcolm shows that tata in the American language means father. In Irish, dad, Welsh, tad, or tadus, armoric. Pat, Cornish, Tat, and Tas, Scotch, Dad, St. Kelda, Tat, and in Guatemala, Tat, in Old Italy, Tata, in Egypt, Dade, in Greek, Teta, in Old English, Dadi, the American Tat, Da, in the Indian, Tat, all right, so Guatemala, Tat, right, so we say Tata, after showing a great length that the Mexicans must have had their mythology from Asia, East of the Hindus, they must have known. He's seen it in reverse. Remember, America's a true old world. Mr. Humboldt observed that he finds among them neither the linga nor any of those figures with several heads and hands which characterize the paintings and figures of the Hindus. But he distinctly admits that he finds the doctrine of repeated generations and cycles. Now, this again seems to confirm my hypothesis that they migrated from the old world so early as to be before these corruptions, early as the Linga was. And it has induced me to review the early history of Buddhism and to make me suspect that in its early works, the Linga is not to be found and that it only came into use when the division between the followers of the Linga and the Ioni began to arise, which caused the horrific civil and religious wars noticed in my former volume. The founder of the Peruvian nation was called Oshika, the sun and emblem of the sun. He was high priest of Soga Mosul. Here we have the Saga. His wife was called Chia. Chia is nothing but Eva, corrupted. Isis, or the moon, Isis. He was described with three heads. Here, I think, are Buddha and Trimurti of India. His priests were called Shekes or Sakes. These are the Sakas or Sagas or priest of wisdom, all right? So again, he's breaking it down, maybe seeing it in reverse, but who are the ancient Nagas? We got the drop already. He's literally saying that. Humble says the form of government given by Boshika to the inhabitants of Bogota is very remarkable. From its analogy with those of Japan and Tibet, the Incas of Peru united in their person the temporal and spiritual powers the children of the sun were both priests and kings. Again, both priests and king. We're talking about priests, kings, a khan. The pontiffs or lamas, the successors of Boshika, were considered as heirs of his virtue and sanctity. The people flocked in crowds to offer presents to the high priest. 
visiting those places which were consecrated by the miracles of Boshika. And on many writings and books that we've gone over research, Boshika is the same of Quetzalcoatl and Viracocha. In a very particular and pointed manner, this Boshika is said to be white or albus, I touched the hijack, pure. This reminds me that the Sibyl pronounces the white so of Alba to be black. Alba means white. Was Bochica Alp or LB L50 B2 52? He had a peculiar cycle of 13 years and another of 413s or 52. This looks as if there was some reference to our astrological instrument called playing cards, which certainly came from North India. This does not seem so wonderful when we consider that we have just found their cycles, the same as the indictions of Constantine. What is the Romish Alb? The Peruvians believe in one supreme being, the creator of heaven and earth, called Viracocha and Pachacamac, all right? They go Viracocha, is what I was saying, who had revealed to them his religion, Dash the Hijack. The Mexicans called their great god, Jao, ineffable. And represented him by an eye in a triangle. An eye in a triangle. I thought that was the Illuminati sign, huh? The back of your dollar. Do you guys hear that? The cross was everywhere adored. And the symbol of the cross was everywhere. The Mexicans expected a Messiah. They expected a Messiah and everything. Their history of the flood is almost a close copy of that of Moses. Their baptisms in the presence of witnesses is almost the same as that of the Jews and Persians. And in the same manner, they named their children and offered them in the temple. All right, again, they started with the Peruvians, then it went on to the Mexicans. So there's a lot of people in between that and a lot of nations they're grouping together as Peruvians and Mexicans, right? So they had the customs of sacrificing the firstborn. The same as the Jews, till it was done away by Abraham or Moses. They had also the rite of circumcision. Their temples were in the form of a cross and faced the four cardinal points. Their language has many Greek and Hebrew words in it because it originated here. Remember my phonetics video, who are the Maya? The Maya went and civilized a lot of the world. So-called Phoenician, Phoenician language, Paleo-Hebrew, so-called Greek. Come on. They have a sacred and select word like the Indian Om, which is never spoken. But what it is, I do not find mention. The union of the Jewish and the Christian mythos in one system, instead of their division into two systems, at once proved that they cannot have been brought to Mexico at different and distant periods. Had this been the case, there would have been two religions, as in all other cases in opposition to one another. It is a wonderful circumstance that the Jews coming from the city of Egypt, built by Alexander, what Egypt, huh? Should have forgot to bring with them the knowledge of letters and iron, and still more wonderful. All right, so he made a point right there. He's saying if it was supposed the Egyptians that came, they would have brought iron. They would have brought a lot of things that supposedly they didn't find here, right? They wouldn't just come and, hey, teach a little bit of this and not stay in this beautiful place. Because the truth is, the ancient Egyptians or people of Tamari were from here. That the Christian monks coming in a later day should have had equally bad memories. All that was necessary was for those Jews to have told these skillful smelters of metals that by melting the lumps of their native iron in a wood fire, they would get iron and steel. The identity of the Mexican and Chinese or North Indian mythos as being unquestionable attempts have been made in several periodical publications to account for their similarity by supposing that the Mexicans were colonies fleeing from the arms of Mohammedan or Tartarian conquerors. And I would say part of that may be true. There was a lot of uh, waves of migration into Mexico, not all the same people. But the writers do not tell us how the Jewish and Christian doctrines came to be found in America mixed most intimately together and also with the idolatry of North India and Greece. Other writers contend that these colonists were Mongol or Tartar conquerors who not contended with the conquest of China conquered America also. Well, and it's something we might end up finding out, you know, 
who are these invading so-called Mexico people, Aztec people. But this leaves all the great difficulties I have stated above unremoved. It is a most wonderful thing that these Tartarian heroes did not take with them the knowledge of higher nor letters, and that they being Mohammedans should convey the Christian religion to Mexicans instead of the Muhammad. That makes sense. It is also wonderful that they should take with them the knowledge of the horse and the ass, though they did not take these animals themselves. So exactly, wouldn't they bring all these animals? Pictures of them being seen everywhere, mixed with their other hieroglyphics. And what is still more, as the reader will instantly see, mixed most intimately with the Judean mythos. A hero mounted on an ass or a horse, sometimes carrying a sword, sometimes a cross. It is impossible on viewing them not to recollect the procession of Jesus Christ on the ass into Jerusalem. How about Jehoshua after the Exodus? The mythoses are evidently identical, but their variations show that they are not copies. Though they have plenty of pictures of the horse, the animal, be it observed, notice in the revelation they have no knowledge of the elephant or camel. But these were not in the revelation, were no part of the mythos. They have no sheep, but they have an animal like it, which they call llama or lamb. No part of the Mexican hieroglyphics is more striking than the exhibition of the horse or ass. For some are doubtful, all right? So again, what he's saying is the representation of the horse is all over, all over the codices, a lot of the hieroglyphics. You know, we already know horses originated in America, and they were here when the Spaniards arrived. Check out my horse, uh, Origin of the Horse in America video for the info. Animals totally unknown in a state of nature to the Americans. I right, touched the hijack. I refer to the plates figures. Faria and Souza, the Jesuit says that when the Portuguese arrived in the Azores, they found a statue caught on the side of a mountain of a man on horseback wearing a cloak, his left hand on the horse's mane, his right pointing to the west, with an inscription on the lower rock, but not understood. All right. Now, remember, we read this in my book, I believe it was Shadow of Atlantis, uh, chapter three or something like that, where we read, as he says here in the Azores, the statue. Same one. Remember that video, guys? pointing towards America, and what appeared to be an American Indian. It is necessary to observe here that tribes both of Negroes and bearded men were found in South America. Again, are you guys listening? I'm going to repeat that. All right? It is necessary to observe here, guys, that tribes both of Negroes and bearded men were found in South America. Antiquities of Mexico, Volume 6. The Codex Vaticanus, Volume 2, is marked 3738. The plates in it are numbered to 146, but the explanation goes only to plate 92. In either English or Spanish, the explanation purports to be in Volume 6, page 155 of Lord Kingsborough's work. My reader has only to look to the figures of the crucifixes which I have given in Figure 12 and 14, and to reflect for one moment upon the admitted anxiety of the Spaniards and the Popes to keep the knowledge of these things from the European world. Remember, they were making sure they were only sent people that they would trust or that worked for them. They were censoring everything coming out of America. They were just sending their Franciscan uh, friars and all that. So they kept the knowledge of these things from the European world to see why the explanation of the Codex Vaticanus ends with plate 92. The remainder has no doubt been suppressed to avoid the necessity of giving an explanation of the crucifixes. We everywhere meet with the Mexican divine names ending in Tle, as Teotle, that is Deo or God Tle. It has been observed by Lord Kingsborough, as well as by almost all the Spanish authors, that the Mexican language is so full of Hebrew words as to be almost Hebrew. It is he, so-called Hebrew, original mother tongue, whatever you want to call it. It's here. America's a true old world. Yes, you see, guys, I didn't write this stuff. I didn't write this book. This book's from the 1830s, and he's quoting other authors from the past. Primary sources, historical records. Continuing. We have seen the god 
everywhere crucified and suspended from the cross. So also the image of somebody being crucified or hung from a tree or cross, you know, that's all over the Americas. Pre-Columbian, before Europeans arrived, we have found the sacred animal, the llama or sheep. We have found the mythos of the crucified savior, right? So when they talk about the llama or sheep, I mean, there were shepherds here and legends of a crucified savior. We have found everything at last to center in the sun. The word tle is confessed not to be understood by the Mexicans, nor by the Spaniards who call it, for that reason, merely a termination. All these matters considered, I think it may be the same as the word tletla, the Hebrew name of the sign of the zodiac, Agnes or Aries. In Hebrew, it means when spelled with the tau, tle, hanged or suspended. Okay? I believe it meant crucified by hanging on a cross. Hanging, right? Hanging. Who's getting hanged? It was originally Buddha, as noticed before in section 3, page 24. For the same reason that the word meaning 650 was applied to him, it was in succession applied to the God of Wisdom, to the Lamb, his second emblem, and to the crucified God, Krishna. All the mosaic history is to be found in China, according to Mons, Parave, in which he only repeats what was before pointed out by Bergeron, the Guinness, and the Chinese historians relate that one of their ancient despots endeavor to destroy their old records, but that a copy of their history called the Chao King escaped. That book treats of the terrestrial paradise, its rivers, waters of immortality, its admirable trees, fall of the angels and of man, and the appearance of that moment of mercy, also of the Sabbath, confusion of tongues, the mana in the wilderness, the Trinity, and the Holy One in the West, who was incomprehensible, the one with the Tien. It states that the world cannot know the Tien except by the Holy One, who only can offer a sacrifice acceptable to the Chang Ti or Khan Ti, Priest King Ti. The nations are waiting for him like plants for a refreshing shower. The Tien is the Holy One invisible, and the Holy One is the Tien made visible and teaching men. All this was taught by Confucius 550 years before Christ. Ancient inscriptions state that Jews to have come into China about the time of Confucius. This is probably the arrival of a colony of doctrine of a new incarnation going to them from the western Iodia. The secret doctrine of the renewed incarnation seems, by being misunderstood, to have operated with them precisely as it did with their Indian and Tibetan neighbors, for they are the Tibetan or Buddhist faith, into which all these doctrines dovetail perfectly. These facts and many more details from different authors by the learned Nimrod, volume 3, page 510. All these things, good people, like Nimrod supposed, were taught to the Tartars and Chinese by the lost tribes of Samaria. Those tribes are most useful people. They account for every difficulty. In the east, in the west, in the north, in the south, they are always ready at hand. Here is all the Jewish and the Christian mythos amalgamated precisely as it is in Mexico, in Tibet, North India, and South India all carrying with it proofs of its almost universal prevalence or dissemination. But withstanding that we find remnants of this mythos everywhere, the actual character of which cannot be doubted, yet in the respective countries where they are found, the system is obsolete. They are remnants of an almost forgotten system. They everywhere carry traits of the system of regeneration or the cycles recorded in the old druidical circles of cyclopean monuments found along with them the origin of which is acknowledged to be totally unknown all right who was the ancient druids all right apply what we've learned before about who was settling ireland in the british house there cannot be any doubt that they have all flowed from the same fountain yep from the true old world have the same origin yes and the only question will be whether they flowed from the kingdom of the West. Yes, the kingdom of the West, America, which Herodotus could not find. 
All right, they've been talking about America the whole time. And Alexander thought it not worth his while to notice or from the kingdom of Ayodhya of India, with its capital probably as appears from its ruins, once the largest in the world, a city larger than London, the capital of an empire more extensive than Europe. There is scarcely a page of Lord Kingsborough's work which does not exhibit proofs of the anxiety of the Spanish government to suppress the information which I have just now detailed. All this information was suppressed. The Vatican hid all this when they found all this stuff here in the Americas and kept out of our school textbooks. And which does not allow to show that it comes to us through the medium of the most unwilling of witnesses. Every contrivance which was possible was resorted to in order to prevent its arrival in Europe. And this accounts for the extraordinary and systematic opposition to the admission of strangers into New Spain. All people likely to be intelligent, such as physicians, persons suspected of heresy, were prohibited from going theater, all right? People that could be considered intelligent or think for themselves. Again, they were just sending their friars and Dominicans and Franciscans. They were literally controlling who was coming over here, as they just told you right here. The reason assigned by the Spanish government was that they were prevented going, that they might not create disputes and prevent conversions. The author of the notes of Lord Kingsborough's book says that he believes that the Jews colonized America and held it for 1,000 years, and that they introduced, as it must have been along with their own, the Christian rites, into the religion of the Mexicans, right, Dosh the Hijack, who had never heard of Christianity, to show their hatred of Christianity and turn it into ridicule. So they showed the Indians Christianity. So Hebrews, so you're talking about Israelites, Hebrews showed the Indians Christianity so they can later on mock them. That makes no sense. You see how they try to explain things? Both those things originated here because this is the true old world, period. And that it was for this reason that they established the Christian doctrines along with those of the Jews. Dash the hijack, all right? Such as the resurrection, ascension. The passage is so extraordinary that I think the writer must have meant it for a joke, all right? So see, that's what I'm saying. You can't take that so serious. It makes no sense. The close connection between the Americans and the old world was long ago seen. Again, the close connection between the Americans and the old world, because this is the old world, was long ago seen. A lot of people have already written about it. Notwithstanding all the exertions of the Spaniards to keep mankind in the dark, and fruitless endeavors were made by Grotius and others to find a cause for it. An account of them may be seen in Basnash. It is there observed that one of the districts has a German name, Estoteland, and the name of a young sheep is Lam, that one of their gods is called Teut, and one of their kings, Teut, evidently the same name, that their great creative principle is called Pachakama, Piamkama, that is Piakam, the wisdom of divine love, that they baptize their children in the form of the cross and have a notion of the Trinity, that they adorn their idols with the cross and mitre, and that they have a kind of Eucharist, that virgins consecrated to the God make effigies of paste and honey, which they consecrate with much ceremony, and afterwards distribute to the people who believe they eat the body of their God. The people of North America were taught by pen to have an unaccountable likeness to the Jews. All right, we have that first-hand account by William Penn. He said that, and he goes on to say, Penn, and the Masajati were taught to be found in Massachusetts. Tibet is called Tangutia. This is evidently Ia Tangut, the country of Tangut, the close similarity of the Trinitarian and other doctrines of the Tibetans to those of the Romish Christians we have seen. It is surely a very extraordinary thing to find a Peruvian triune god called Tanga Tanga, evidently the same as the god of Tibet, both in name and characters the same in volume 6 page 79 the mexican courts are shown to have had exactly the same number of judges as those of the jews that their sacred numbers were exactly the same and that both nations kept fast for exactly the same number of days all right if it walks like a cat talks like a cat <laughs> you guys already know it is a cat <laughs> lord kingsborough says 
the common law of every state in Europe, has been confessedly modeled after the Mosaic law. And that's true. We got Glenn Beck uh, letting us know. And, you know, we already know the founders of the British Isles. Come on now. This is a very important observation. And I think its truth will not be disputed. But I think there is no other way of accounting for it than to go to my primal nation. The common law in most states is evidently older than Christianity. We are told that St. Augustine brought Christianity into this island in the year 596. But was there no Christianity in the time of Constantine or before? Lord Kingsborough says the affinity between the Mexican and the Hebrew laws is greater than between the latter and those of any nation with which we are acquainted, all right? It's actually more resemblances with Hebrew people than Christians. That's what he's saying. They circumcised with a stone knife, the use of which was expressly ordered. It is remarkable that the circumcision of the Jews should have been performed with a knife made of stone, which is emphatically noticed in the Bible. Easter Island is situated, and those are the degrees right there they're showing, it may be considered to be a part of America. The most remarkable curiosity in this island is a number of colossal statues. On the east side of the island were seen the ruins of three platforms of stone work, on each of which had stood four of these large statues. But they were all falling down from two of them and one from the third. They were broken or defaced by the fall. One was 15 feet long and six feet broad over the shoulders. Each statue had its own head, a large cylindric stone of a red color, wrought perfectly round. Others measured nearly 27 feet and upwards of 8 feet over the shoulders, and a still larger one was seen standing, the shade of which was sufficient to shelter all the party of Captain Cook, who reports this from the sun. The workmanship is rude, but not bad, nor are the features of the face ill-formed. The ears are long, according to this distortion practice in that island and the bodies have hardly anything of a human figure about them how these islanders wholly unacquainted with any mechanical power could raise such stupendous figures and afterwards place the large cylindric stones upon their heads is truly wonderful it is observed that the most probable conjecture is that the stone is factitious the island is about 10 or 12 leagues in circumference it must be in the gulf of california but see Cook and Forrester's Voyages, March 1774. The Encyclopedia Londinensis says, The names of the two statues left standing are Dago and Taurico. Here we have Dagon and Taurus. Surely nothing can be more curious than these statues. Who placed them here? And when were they set up? Everyone must remember the accounts of the perfect horror with which the unhappy Mexicans viewed the first horses which the Spaniards took over to their country. This I will now account for. It appears from Lord Kingsborough's book that they had all the mythos which had seen so fully explained of the old world, the Immaculate Conception, the Crucifixion, the Resurrection after three days, the expectation of the return of their crucified Savior. Every Indian inquirer knows that the last avatar was always expected by the people of Java to come mounted on a white horse. Now, in several of the Mexican hieroglyphic pictures, though their owners knew nothing of the horse, an animal, which might be either a horse or an ass, is painted. All right, so dodge the hijack, so of course they knew the horse. In these same pictures, the other parts of the mythos, the crucifixions, are described. From this, it is evident that although they were not able to convey the horse over the sea, yet they could convey every part of the mythos. The result of this was that when the Spaniards arrived in flying machines or machines propelled by the winds on the wings of the wind across the boundless ocean or from heaven, their commander mounted on an unknown animal described in their ancient pictures to be that on which the promised God was to come and carrying in his hand thunder and lightning with which he destroyed his enemies at miles distant from him. He was believed to be the last avatar. All right, so there's, you know, Dr. Hyde, I was going to say in the Indians, thought, you know, that the Spaniards were gods, you know, according to what they tell us, right? Lord Kingsborough gives a very interesting account of the effect which this superstition or belief had upon their conduct, taken away from most of them from devotion, all wish to resist their god, mounted on his horse and surrounded by thunder and lightning, and from others through fear, 
all power thus given to their cruel enemies an easy victory. I cannot conceive it possible to devise anything more conclusive of the truth of my whole system than this. All this accounts for numbers of circumstances relating to the conduct of Montezuma and his people, which have hitherto been utterly unintelligible. And I think it seems evident that if the miscreants from Spain had really understood their own case, they would have had nothing to do but to have quietly taken possession of the whole empire as its last avatar and newly arrived god. Well, indeed, my Peter Martyr, Las Casas, and Torquemada be puzzled with the horse. The actual horse of the revelation is a country where the people had not the knowledge of the animal or indeed of any animal of the old world. All right, that's the hijack. This is opinions here. Instead of accepting the possession of the empire, peaceably offered to them by a most observed and extraordinary mistake, the Spaniards determined to terrify the people by ill usage, the account of which is given in the antiquities of Mexico. Colonel Todd states the mountains above Tibet, the highest ridge of Asia, to be called Andes. This must have been in the countries of Tungusians. It is impossible on reading this not to recollect the Andes and the Tanga Tanga of Peru. So, did you guys know that the highest ridges of Tibet and Asia are called the Andes? Come on now. And it is equally impossible to attribute this paranomasia and the other circumstances already described to accident. That is no accident. To account for this, I look into ancient histories and I adopt the first rational and philosophical cause which is recorded and without difficulty. I find it in the communication formed by the island of Atlantis of Plato. All right, here we go back to Atlantis. We we're just talking about the true old world America. That's why the Andes, uh, the word is from here, and they brought it over to Tibet. Same thing from here, so called Atlantis. For the subsequent submersion of such an island or continent is neither improbable nor irrational. But when the attendant circumstances are considered, a dry historical fact carrying probability on the face of it, it is no more improbable than the effects we see produced by volcanoes every day. It is neither impossible nor improbable that when the Atlantis sunk, something of the same kind should have happened in the northern Pacific Ocean. The legend of the sinking of a very large island is now well known in China and Japan, and in both places an annual festival is kept to celebrate the escape of an excellent prince called Peirun. All right, a prince called Peirun, or Peru, right? A prince. I cannot help suspecting an identity of mythos or an identity of fact. I apprehend it. I apprehend if the whole or great part of the Polynesian islands constituted the highest grounds of a large continent, which sunk the effect would be when the sinking took place to raise up the waters so as to drown all the inhabitants and after a short time to subside and leave the point of the mountains dry as islands. After all, a great difficulty must be allowed to exist in all speculations on this subject, arising from the fact that there are none of the animals of one continent found in the other. The Mexicans in their histories, as already stated, say they arrived in their present country from the west. So again, this author is going to try to say that, you know, America was empty and it was peopled by people from the old world. You know, he's seen it in reverse. So the Mexicans never said they were coming from Europe or, or Asia or anything like that, specifically. They always persist most strenuously that it was from the west they came. And they described towns on the coast where they remained for many years in their progress to their present situation the ruins of which they assert are yet to be seen. They say they came across the sea from another country. Now, was this Atlantis or not? It is very desirable that the remains of the towns should be sought for. Lord Kingsborough has gone to an enormous length and proven that the Mexican rites, ceremonies, etc., etc., were almost precisely the same as those of the Jews and that they must consequently have been brought by the Jews to Mexico. No. See, again, guys, you see how they always try to make it in reverse? Now we have a better orientation. We know they're seeing it in reverse. But one most important observation offers itself on this. We possess what we believe to be the knowledge of all the Jewish rites, 
history, et cetera, et cetera, in Syria. But this is not the way all these things are known by the Americans, okay? It actually was here. All the things said to have taken place in Western Syria, both with Jews and Christians, are said to have been acted in America. Listen, he's telling you it actually happened here in America. And the case, in a great measure, is the same in India and China. There is the same standing still on the sun, the same popu lifugia, the same deluge and person saved in a ship, the same immaculate conception, the same crucifixion and resurrection, but they were all in the American country, not Syria. Again, all this happened in America, the true old world, not in Syria, not in modern Syria, all right? Major drop here. I hope you guys are listening. Hope you guys enjoying this reading. Body bag for the illusion. All that. All that took place here in the American country, not in Syria. Now, it is very improbable that if the Jews of Western Judea or of Moses had gone in a body from their old country, they would ever wish or permit their history to be located in the new one. Towers of Babel to be built waters to be passed or places to be shown where the sun stood still nothing can account for all this except that in all countries including among them western judea it was the figurative description of the renewed avatars according to the author it seems to me that the mythos which i have shown to have universally prevailed accounts in a satisfactory manner with one exception for all the difficulties parts of it we have seen everywhere a small part of it in one place and a small part in another, but all, including the Jewish, the same mythos, the discovery of the same system in America as that in South India, in North India, in Tibet, in Western Syria, etc., proves that at some extremely remote era, the same mythos must have prevailed and the variations which we find, whilst at the same time the general characters preserved are what we may naturally expect would arise as time advanced. What we have now are the debris of the system. We must recollect that the neglect to teach the Mexicans the art of writing and making iron cannot be attributed merely to a few stray mariners and fishermen blown across the ocean. All right, listen to what he's saying. It can't just be from shipwrecks from the old world of people coming. It really can't. All this originated here. Nobody brought that stuff. The knowledge of the Americans, if carried to them at all in later times, must have been carried by regular colonies from Greece who taught them the rights and name of Bacchus of colonies from Syria, who taught them all the many parts of Judean mythos, of colonies from tottering China, or of colonies of Europe who taught them modern but not Papist Christianity. Is there a human being so credulous as to believe that all these colonies or parties of migrators following one another time after time should have omitted to convey the knowledge of iron and letters? Listen, this is deep. He's saying all these people came here, right? Supposedly from the other part of the world. They had iron and all these languages and stuff. How come they didn't leave that knowledge here? I am sure no person will be found to believe this. Then what are we to believe? But that one great and learned race held all these doctrines as taught by me in a period of the world when the intercourse between the old and new worlds was easy compared with what it is at this time. And if America was involved, and you see how sophisticated it is, it had to have been the center, the origin. We know it's the true old world. We know a lot of things started over here. We know we had corn, agriculture, all this accounts. The one exception alluded to above is the difficulty of accounting for means by which the system reached America. To meet this, may we not have recourse to the formerly named island of Atlantis? <laughs> this is Atlantis, all right? That's why. Of the submersion of which we are informed by Plato, and which I suppose almost connected the two worlds, connected Atlantis and America. It was connected, almost connected. Yeah, not all of it sank. We're still here. It was probably so near both that in the frail boats of those days, listen, he said it was probably so close, Atlantis and America were probably so close to each other that probably in the frail boats of those days, colonies could pass, but in which the large animals could not be conveyed. Of course, this submersion must have taken place 
and cut off the communication between two worlds before the knowledge of letters and the use of iron. It cannot be believed that if ever the Mexicans had been told of the existence and use of iron, excellent refiners and smelters of metals as they were, that they would not instantly have obtained it from their mountains where it is found in its native state. I shall be asked how they could pass in any great numbers without the means of conveying the horse, the cow, the sheep. For if the two worlds were nearly connected by intermediate island or islands, the passage of the animals would have taken place. I admit the force of the argument in its fullest extent, as I do the difficulty of accounting for the extraordinary fact that there were none of the animals of the old world in America or right touch the hijack. However, at last, an intimate connection between the two worlds must be admitted to have existed, and to have existed before the knowledge of iron or letters in the countries the Mexicans came from. Some persons have taught that the Americans were colonies who passed by the north, where the continents joined, or nearly joined, and to the question why they had not the horse, it may be replied that if the natives of Tartary or China emigrated by the north in the neighborhood of the Arctic Circle, it must have been that route. There is reason to believe that the horse could not have been conveyed through this cold climate, all right? So that's their, like, barren straight theories, all right? So that's the hijack with all that. That's what I'm saying. The horse was here. This author tries to use, like, the animals as proof of, of something. It really isn't. If we admit this, then we may suppose that the migration took place from China, where the Hebrew language was spoken, and where the Hebrew and Christian system flourished, as it has before been shown to have done in a very early period, all right? That's future videos, Hebrew and ancient China and Japan. Yeah, the writing and all that is Hebrew. And if the emigrants went from China, we must thus account for their going without taking with them the knowledge of syllabic writing. If we suppose a body of Japanese or Chinese amounting only to a few thousand on the arrival in Mexico, now remember this author is seeing everything in reverse. We went to Japan. Who's the Mayas? Who's the Nagas? We went over there. Remember Queen Mu book? All the research we've done before? Yeah. So this author's trying to figure it out. You know, why all this old world stuff? It just seems like America's the old world, but he just can't say it is, you know? So he's trying to explain all of it right now, as you guys can see. Lord Kingsborough's work is unquestionably the most magnificent ever undertaken by an individual. It is, indeed, an honor to his order and to his country to bring it together into one view by means of lithographic copies. The different manuscripts from different and distant countries will prove, indeed, has already proved of the greatest importance to science and must greatly aid the philosopher in his inquiries. All right. And that's the end of the chapter, guys. I hope you guys uh, enjoyed it. I mean, it's pretty deep. Basically, a lot of it is going over what uh, Lord Kingsborough uh, had translated from the codices and other stuff. You know, Mr. Higgins' research on his own. But I thought a lot of this was very interesting. I wanted to reread this. I haven't read the full chapter before, and I wanted to be able to do that. I've taken out little parts here and there in certain videos. But I really wanted to read the whole chapter to you guys, especially to the new people. And I just want to ask you, can't you see? It's unquestionable. We are in the true old world. You see all these so-called mythos. We have everything from the old world. All the legends. All the folklore. All the Bible stories. All the mythology. Everything. It's here. It's always been here. And it wasn't brought by anybody. This is the origin of it. So remember to pull out the babies out of what we read. And dodge the hijack when we heard it. This is a lot of deep, good information. We might get back to this book and future videos again. But I'm glad I got through that chapter with you guys. Thanks for reading along with me again. We've been reading so many books. More proof America's a truer world. Look at all the different connections you guys can put together and, and research it further. Hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did reading it. So thanks for uh, tuning in once again. Much love and respect. Pura vida, mi gente. Wow.